Okay, let's go to the Lord in prayer. God, thank you for um, the truth of sound doctrine that you, God, have inspired. We know that it is uh, your word of truth inspired by you, God, who is truth. And uh, Lord, we know sound doctrine promotes healthy living. Sound doctrine promotes godly and God-honoring living. And Lord, that's what we desire, especially as we're studying the pastorals, Lord, and we see the devastating reality of false doctrine, what it can do to people, what it can do to churches. Uh, Lord, may we just drink in your truth today so that we, uh, Lord, who have been entrusted with the truth, the tr sound doctrine, may, we may be faithful, uh, Lord, in standing strong on it and passing it, it on to others so that, Lord, your church and churches will bring glory to your holy name. So we pray for your blessings on our time now in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, let's open our Bibles. Let's go to 1 Timothy chapter 1. We continue our study through the pastorals. As you can see on the screen behind me, we have the outline we're going to use of 1 Timothy. Uh, we have five main sections that we really want to hit on. Um, that are bracketed by Paul's greeting and then Paul's charge to this young pastor, Timothy, uh, who he was teaching, uh, or uh, really encouraging to be able to teach uh, and get things in order in the church there. Um, the last class, I think two classes actually, we've been focused on Paul's greeting to Timothy. And again, we can just look at it real quick in verses one and two. Paul, he starts out uh, the normal uh, Greco-Roman uh, greeting of that time. He says, let me tell you who's writing this. He says, Paul, who is Paul? He goes, I'm an apostle of Christ Jesus, not an apostle of a church, not an apostle of, of, uh, of his own making. He's an apostle chosen, sent by Jesus Christ. In fact, uh, he's a, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the command, kat epitagon. It's a royal command that he received from God our Savior, and of Christ Jesus our hope. And again, as I said, I believe it was in the last class, um, Paul knew Timothy. Uh, Timothy was Paul's son in Christ. Uh, he, Timothy had ministered with Paul for many years. So this is a very formal greeting. Like, hey, Timothy's probably going, well, I know who you are, Paul. You don't need to say, okay, I'm an apostle of Christ Jesus by the command of God our Father and of the Lord Jesus Christ. No, we believe Paul, yes, he was writing to Timothy, but he was also writing to the church or churches there in Ephesus. He was writing to people who knew he knew we were going to read this letter um, as Timothy shared it with them. Uh, and there were probably people who were doubting Paul as a true apostle. So he wanted to start out right away to say, okay, I'm writing this to Timothy, but he also had in mind other people in those churches who were not so willing to listen to Paul. In verse 2, he says, To Timothy, my true son, I love that, Gnesios technon, true, genuine, real, authentic son in the faith. He said, Grace, mercy, and peace. This is his salutation to Timothy. From God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. And boy, did Timothy need grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ, right? As we've been learning, Timothy had a huge task there the church or possibly churches he was overseeing in Ephesus. Man, they were messed up. And why were they so messed up? Well, again, we see our first major section after uh, the greeting. Paul uh, had to address this big issue. There was a lot of false doctrine in the church. And what we're going to do today is we're going to really focus on that. We're going to focus on verses 3 through 11. And what I want to do is I want to show you who these false teachers were, and some of the false doctrine they were teaching. And I want to show you the devastating effects of false doctrine. You know, it's very easy to let just, you know, <laughs> unsound doctrine pass through. 
Very easy. Ah, you don't want to deal with it. I don't want to argue with people. I don't want them arguing with me. Well, we don't want to have fights and quarrels with people. But Paul said to Timothy, and you can just look over here in uh, verse 18. Paul gives Timothy the permission to fight. But what kind of fight? Timothy, my son, I'm giving you this command to fight false doctrine in keeping with the prophecies once made about you so that by recalling them, you may fight the fight or the battle. Watch me, Christian. Are you allowed to fight? Absolutely. You should fight the good fight. In fact, isn't that what Paul did? Look at 2 Timothy chapter 4. This is Paul, again, writing to Timothy. This time, Paul's second Roman imprisonment. He's about to die. And look, he kind of gives his farewell to Timothy. He says in verse 6, I am already being poured out like a drink offering, and the time for my departure is near. Paul wasn't talking about getting released from prison. Paul was talking about going home to the Lord. And look what Paul says to Timothy. I have fought with the people in the church. I have fought with other churches, other pastors. What did he say? I have fought the good fight. Christian, if you are not fighting as a Christian, guess what? You're compromising and tolerating false doctrine. The problem is, as Christians very often, we fight the wrong fight. The not so good fight. Again, as I shared with you in one of the classes, I'll never forget my first class in seminary, long before you guys were born. <laughs> Professor said, Christianity is the only army that shoots its own soldiers. And I thought, wow, what in the world did I just get into? <laughs> and isn't it true? And that, isn't that what the devil tries to get us to do? To fight the wrong fight. To tolerate compromise when it comes to God's truth, right? We want to be tolerant and tolerate this, that, and the other thing. It's very interesting. Those people who, who talk about and profess toleration, it's very interesting. They're tolerant about everything except those who are intolerant about them. <laughs> Does that make sense? They tolerate everything except those who don't tolerate them. Okay? So this idea of tolerance... It's a great idea in theory. Guys, I truly believe it's satanic. Because when you tolerate false teaching, you know what you're doing? You're tolerating doctrine from demons. So there's a good fight, the good fight, and that good fight is you do not tolerate false doctrine. You're patient with sinful people. You're kind of sinful people. You counsel sinful people. You, you, you are humble when it comes to dealing with difficulties in ministry and so forth. But you do not tolerate lies. Because if you allow false doctrine to seep into your mind, to seep into your ministry, guess what? Your mind and your ministry is going to be destroyed. Because isn't that what the devil wants? Go to John 10.10. 10. It's real simple. Look what Jesus says. The thief, he's talking about the devil, comes only to, what are the next three, what does he come to do? Steal, kill, and destroy. Well, who is the greatest false teacher? The devil. He's a father of lies. He opposes God's truth. Remember back in the garden? He said to, to Eve, did God really say? You see how he tries to oppose truth? And what did Adam and Eve do? They tolerated lies. Well, maybe we can... Well, this is what the devil does. He comes to steal kill, and destroy. Jesus
Jesus said, on the other hand, I've come that you may have what? Life and have it to the full. So guess what? These are words of life. Health. These are God's words. You tolerate words from the devil in your life or in your ministry? And you expect life from that? It's not going to happen. In fact, uh, I think it was Dr. John Stott made a very interesting statement. He said a deaf church is a dead church. Deaf meaning they don't hear God's truth. Notice what he said. And I agree with it, by the way. Because didn't Jesus say, man does not just live on bread alone, but by every word that comes out of the mouth of the Lord, right? A deaf church that does not hear God's life-giving words is a dead church. Even if it has massive crowds, wonderful techno, and all kinds of emotionally inspiring, frenzy creating, frenzy creating, I don't know if that's proper English, frenzy creating uh, uh, songs and concerts. And a lot of times we look at churches and say, well, that's a really live church. Look at how the Holy Spirit's moving. What do we base it on? We base it on the emotional thermometer. If our emotions, or if we see other people's emotions, oh, that's a blessing from God. And yet you have little sermonettes in between. Sermonettes make Christianettes. Okay? And so a deaf church that does not hear the life-giving words of God is a dead church. No matter what activities, no matter what frenzy, whatever stuff is going on. Does that make sense? Okay. Because life comes from God's food, which is his truth. Back to 1 Timothy. So today, what I want to do is I want to focus on these false teachers and some of the false doctrine they were teaching. And let's see what we can learn from that. Let's start here in verse 3. After uh, Paul had given Timothy uh, the greeting, in verses 3 and 4, Paul says to Timothy, As I urged you when I went into Macedonia, remember, after Paul's first arrest in Rome, that's where the book of Acts finishes. Uh, we believe that Paul was eventually released out of that uh, from house arrest. He went, he started visiting some other some churches he had planted before he eventually went on his fourth missionary journey to Spain. We believe when Paul was released from his first imprisonment and he went and visited other churches, including the church or churches in Ephesus, Timothy had accompanied him. And we believe that when Paul showed up in Ephesus, he found a church or churches that were in a, in a big mess. And he even had to excommunicate some of the elders. Paul then leaves and goes to Macedonia, visits some other areas, and he leaves young Timothy there. So now, shortly after Paul leaves Timothy with his massive task, I mean, can you imagine? I mean, that's like me, Mario, leaving you here in charge after basically I just cleaned house with the leaders. Say, Mario, you got it covered. I'll be back when I'm back. How would that be for you, Mario? Pretty tough, especially because you're a young guy. You got some older people here. People have been here longer. They're not gonna, they don't want to listen to you. And there you are trying to fight false doctrine. You're timid. You're tired. You're sick all the time, like Paul or like Timothy was. Right? And, and Paul now writes a letter and says, come on, Timothy. He's just trying to keep Timothy encouraged. I urged you, he said, when I went into Macedonia, stay there in Ephesus so that you may, what's that word? 
Command, underline that word. Command certain people. Now, actually in the Greek, it's certain men. These false teachers were not, there weren't a ton of them, but their influence was devastating. Certain men. That you may command certain men not to teach what? False doctrines. Underline that. Any longer. Or to devote themselves to what? Myths. Underline that word. Endless what? Genealogies. Underline that word. Why? Paul says to Timothy, those type of things promote what are the next two words? Controversial speculations. Rather than advancing God's work, which is by faith. Faith that you share, you teach God's word accurately, truthfully. You trust by faith that God's work will advance. It may not happen overnight, but it will happen. Because God's word is the food to feed his people. God's word is the scepter to lead his people. But I got to tell you something, false doctrine is a lot easier to teach. And it's a lot easier to sell. Now, let's break this down. First thing here, we're going to learn about three types of teachers in this section, verses 3 through 20. Today, I want to focus on the first group, the false teachers and their misuse of the law. Next class, we'll take a look at Paul and his true gospel. And then we'll look at Timothy's choice he has to make. You're going to follow these false teachers? You're going to... Follow Paul. Timothy, you've got to fight the good fight. Make sense? So here today, Paul, in this section here, let's just break it down. He said, I urge you when I went into Macedonia to stay there in Ephesus so that you may command, look on the screen, the Greek word is pedangelo. It is a strong, strong command. Paul was telling young Timothy, Timothy, you can't be shy on this one. You can't compromise on this one. You can't tolerate on this one. You got to command these people to stop. It's a military command. Tom, you've been in the military for a long time. <laughs> All right? When you received a command as a subordinate from an authority figure, did you have a choice on that one? No, you now, as an authority figure, those subordinates under you, when you give them a command, what do you expect them to do? Stop or do what you're telling them to do, right? Well, that's what Paul was telling Timothy. Timothy, there are no excuses here now. I know you're young. I know you're timid. I know you get sick a lot. But here's the deal, Timothy. You need to command these false teachers. Pen and Gala. Not to teach false doctrines. Now watch. The Greek uh, words there, as you can see on the screen, are hetero. Hetero means false. Okay? Different. Completely different. The Daskalias doctrine. In fact, we believe that Paul actually coined this term because we don't really see it anywhere else in the scriptures. It is the opposite of sound doctrine. And the word for sound, two words for sound doctrine, we see didaskalias for doctrine. Look at the word hugianino, sound. Where do we get our English word? What's the English word? Hygiene. On Croatian, hygiene, yeah? It's where you get hygiene from, right? So you got heteros and hygiene. <laughs> hygiene, right? Healthy, wholesome, promoting life and health, promoting spiritual life and health. That's sound doctrine. There, that's, that's what you can expect from sound doctrine, right? Same way you can expect from good hygiene, right? You're going to have wholesome life, clean life, healthy life. But from heteros doctrine... Look what you get. Verse 4. Myths. The Greek word is muthos. 
You get all kinds of genealogy, speculation. Watch, watch, watch. We, that's why we believe uh, uh, what was happening here, uh, one of the false, type, false ty- types of false doctrine was being uh, taught there uh, was a misuse of, of God's law. And we're going to get into that in a few moments. Uh, misuse of Judaism, okay? A lot of the Jewish teachers got caught up in this. Myths and endless genealogies. Uh, have you ever heard of allegorical uh, or allegories? Allegories were, okay, you read something, and what you try to do is you try to dig down and find some sort of deeper meaning. Okay? And in, in Judaism, in certain sects of Judaism, what they would do is they would go into the Old Testament and they would go through the genealogies. And they would assign numbers to the names of the people there. And based on these numbers, they did some sort of allegorical whatever, and they would come up with like crazy, crazy stuff. Like crazy stuff. And obviously, it wasn't of God. Okay? And so, Paul says to Timothy, Timothy, I'm urging you here. You got to command these people to stop teaching heteros doctrine. Because Timothy, it's about myths, endless genealogies. What is it causing the church? Controversy and all kinds of speculations. You know, Crusho, I think that what God meant when he called Abraham out of Ur, this is what I think. Crusho goes, well, this is what I think. Where would you get that, Crusho? Well, based upon the numbering thing, you know, numerology and all that. Y- you see? And then I go, I don't agree with you. Crusho goes, I don't agree with you. Speculation causes what? Controversy. We're not fighting the good fight. We're fighting the wrong fight, right? You see what happens? You've got hygiene doctrine, hygiene. (laughs) What does it do? Health, wholesome living, spiritual life, right? You've got heteros doctrine, myths, endless genealogies, controversy and speculations. And Paul says, I want you to pet and gallow those people. Stop. It's over. Now, who were these false teachers? Well, I believe that they were actual leaders or even elders in the church. And the reason why I say that, let's just take a look at a couple. I'll give you four examples. Go down to verse 7. Paul describes these teachers. They want to be what? Teachers. Well, we know that's the role of an elder, right? Uh, go over to chapter 3. As Paul talks about the role of an overseer, look what he says about him in the end of verse 2. He must be able to what? Teach. Do you see it? So we see that these false, okay, heteros guys actually were teachers. That's a role for an elder, Right? Sorry, ladies. Uh-uh. <laughs> no, we'll actually get into that in a couple weeks. Okay? So we think they were elders. Uh, we think number two, the reason being is, uh, go down to verse 20 of chapter 1. Paul had to excommunicate these elders. He said, among them are Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I've handed over to Satan to be taught not to blaspheme so we believe the apostle paul right when he first showed up there in ephesus after he was released right with timothy paul had to excommunicate some teachers who were elders we believe those are the two people at least two of those people now then all of a sudden paul says okay timothy i'll see you later (laughs) you imagine we also believe they are elders because of chapter 3 verses 1 through 7 paul's extreme emphasis on 
raising up qualified elders. Look what he says in verse one. Here's a trustworthy saying. Whoever aspires to be an overseer desires a noble task. It's good to want to be an elder. He says, but look at verse two. The overseer is to be above what? Reproach. And I'll go through that when we go through the section. I'll break it down for you. So we think, again, these guys wanted to be teachers. Paul excommunicates two of the guys who we believe were teachers. And Paul says, for this reason, Timothy, those who want to be elders, that's great. It's a noble task. Here are the qualifications. Moral qualifications, and they have to be able to teach sound doctrine. And we believe these people, these false teachers were elders. Why? Because if you go over to chapter 5, Look at verse 19. Paul talks about dealing with elders who are sinning. He says, do not, in verse 19, entertain an accusation against an elder unless it's brought by two or three witnesses. But, verse 20, look at this. Those elders who are sinning, you are to reprove or discipline before everyone. Guess what? If I am sinning, and you have witnesses, two or three witnesses against me, if I don't repent, if I don't, you know, stop, you know what the church has to do? Bring me right here in front of everybody and rebuke me right here. Why? To scare you. So you don't do it. So that's why we believe these false teachers, back to chapter 1, who were teaching heteros doctrine, who were promoting myths and endless genealogies and controversy and speculations, we believe they were actually leaders in that church or churches. They wanted to be teachers. Paul had to excommunicate two of them. He had to do it publicly. And that's why Paul, in chapter 3, gives Timothy such, such, such extreme details about the proper qualifications of elder. Does that make sense? And I'm going to tell you something right now. As I've been studying and going through chapter 3, the qualifications of an elder, oy vey. Wow. An overseer? Wow. And you know what? My goal is for us to go in that direction. And if we, by God's grace, can meet those qualifications and keep those qualifications, we'll have a very healthy church in churches. But if you've got elders, leaders, who start to get involved in heteros doctrine, it will poison the entire church. That's why Paul said to Timothy, command them to stop now. Paul goes on to say in verse 5, the goal of this command is what? Love. Love towards God. People misread that verse. They say, well, you know, you, you can't really address them. You got to be loving and nice. Is that what Paul was saying in this context? Well, Richard, was Paul saying to Timothy, Timothy, just go up to him and just plead with him and say, please, 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 Mr. Nice Elder, would you please stop teaching false heteros doctrine? Is that what Paul was saying to Timothy? See, a lot of people say, well, no, well, Timothy had to go and approach them in a loving way, caress them and say, please, please, please stop. No. Petting, uh, Tom, <laughs> when you give a command to your subordinates, especially your subordinates who are not doing what you expect them to do, how's your command? Do you stroke them and say, please, please, please? No. That's what Paul was saying to Timothy. He said, the goal of this command is love. Love towards God and his truth. This was no longer about, hey, you know, I'm trying to be nice there. No, this was serious stuff. 
One of your loved ones you find out has cancer. What are you going to do? Let's get rid of it now. Whatever we have to do, right? It's cancer of false teaching. It destroys the body of Christ. You got to get rid of it. And what is the goal of this? Love towards God. Even if it means, Mario, that some of the older guys are going to come down on you, your first love is Christ and his church. The goal of this command is love, which comes from a pure heart. You see, when your first goal is the honor of God, the glory of God, you've got a pure heart. Not only you got to have a pure heart, you've got a good conscience. It comes from sincere faith. You're not trying to command people to stop because you want to look good. You want to throw around your, your authority. No. You are fighting for the integrity of God's name and truth. That's the good fight. And if you tolerate false teaching, shame on you. That means you love people and the acceptance of people more than you love God and his name. That means your heart's not pure, your conscience is not clean, and your faith is fragile. I'm not saying to be a jerk for Jesus. Please understand. That's why I've spent so much time going through this context to show you what was happening there. This was a massive problem. There was no time right now for Timothy to sleep and be shy or lazy or afraid. We were on high alert. They were on high alert. Action needed to be taken, and it needed to be taken immediately for the glory of God. Can you imagine if we understand that and start to do that? We often sing, it's all about you, Jesus. It's all about bringing you glory. Is it? If we compromise this, I mean, think about it. This is the greatest living miracle we have here on earth. Should not we who have been saved by Jesus, who is the way, the truth, and the life, should we not stand firm for his truth? In order to do that, gang, you got to know his truth. You got to study his truth. You got to let his truth get so deep into you that it becomes that compass for your conscience. So that you're able to discern good from evil. Again, somebody comes to you and maybe, you know, I had somebody uh, last night talk to me. Uh, I, was, I was teaching out of Ephesians 1, how God chooses, predestines us and so forth. Father chooses, right before the foundation of time. Son redeems. He did that 2,000 years ago at the cross. Holy Spirit seals you when you hear the word of truth, the gospel of grace, Right? It's all of God, right? Well, I had a person who was visiting here last night saying to me, well, I struggle with that. You know, why does God choose everybody if he chooses? And there was a bit, you know, she's wrestling with it. Well, I didn't like command her to stop saying that. No. You, you know what I'm saying? I mean, she wasn't like promoting false teaching. She's honest and saying, hey, I'm struggling with this. Many people do. I get that. And again, you want to come alongside people and not, look, your goal is not to be right. You, you know what I'm saying? Like, well, I'm just, I'm just going to keep arguing because I want to be right. That's not your goal. Your goal is to be in submission to God's truth. He's the only one who's right. And listen, I don't know everything. I'm learning along the way. I study deeply. I, I try to be faithful to this. But I'm learning. I'm not perfect. So our goal is not to say, well, I'm right and you're wrong. No, God is right. Our goal is for all of us to be in submission to God's truth. To learn it together so we're all going in the same direction. So we have a pure heart, good conscience, and sincere faith. And that our one and only goal is not for us to be right. It's for God to be glorified. Does that make sense? 
Paul says the goal of this command to stop these false teachers. Well, it's love, love for God, which comes from a pure heart, Timothy, and a good conscience and sincere faith. Now watch this. He goes, some, now he's talking about these false teachers. They've departed from these. What have they departed from? Love for God, pure heart, good conscience, and sincere faith. You want a definition of a false teacher? There it is. They're involved in all kinds of myths, endless genealogies, speculations that promote controversy. They don't have love for God. They don't have a good conscience. They don't have a pure heart. They don't have sincere faith because they're working for the devil. Paul, chapter 4, look at verses 1 and 2. The Spirit, meaning the Holy Spirit, clearly says that in later times, some will abandon the what? Faith. And follow what? Deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. Such teachings come through hypocritical liars. And look how he describes their conscience. Their consciences have been seared as with a hot iron. You ever see what cattle ranchers do to cattle? They sear them, right? So that they can no longer what? Feel. What was seared? You see what happens with false teachers? Their consciences become seared by the devil from so much lying that they get to the point that they don't even realize anymore that they're lying. They actually start believing the myths, the genealogy, the speculations, and they love to have controversy. Because Paul said back in verse 6, some have departed from true love for God, good conscience before God, pure heart before God, true faith in God. The word departed, you can see it on the screen there. Astokeo. They've completely missed the mark. We get, that's where we get our word for archery. Okay? What happens when you shoot and miss? You've missed the mark. That's what false teachers do. They miss the mark of truth. They have departed from these and they have turned to what kind of talk? Meaningless. You look on the screen. Matai ologia. It actually means vain talking, worthless talking, talk of fools. So here we go. False teachers, right? Their consciences, in no longer have a good conscience, sincere faith, true love for God, a pure heart. They promote arguments and, and controversy because they're involved in speculations, endless genealogies, and myths. They've missed the mark totally of God's truth. And what they say is the talk of fools. Well, of course it is because they're teaching doctrine of demons. Boy, Andrew, how, how, how can I recognize some of these guys today? Well, here's my first question, or my first statement. When you hear preaching, okay, who's the hero of the sermon? That's the first thing you got to notice. Who's the hero of the sermon? Is it Jesus or the preacher? I mean, that, that's going to give you a pretty good sign, Right? And listen to me, I'm not saying because I'm perfect. I, I want to be the hero of my messages. I want you to love me. I want you to applaud me. I want you to worship me. I'm being honest. Because I have a sin nature. I want to be popular, prideful. I'm right. I want you to come to me for everything. I'm speaking from Mount Sinai. Sure I do. And so do you. 
And I know that so much, and I'm so afraid of that. That's why I go verse by verse. It's my boundaries. I know if I stay that way, that Jesus is the hero of the message. It's that simple. I know if I start coming up with all kinds of... Listen, is it, you know, isn't it amazing? You hear certain messages and it's just like amazing how the illustrations that are used fit perfectly like a glove into the scripture. You know why? In some instances, maybe even many, they're using illustrations from somebody else in somebody else's life. You cannot have illustrations from your own life that fit so perfectly into every part of Scripture. Right? I mean, I remember when I was in seminary, guys were buying books. Back then, internet wasn't quite where it is now. Guys were buying books of illustra for illustrations. And then you just change your name. I mean, what? So I'd rather be boring, dry, not dry or boring, but faithful. Because, again, let's just go real quick to James. Look what James says. Chapter 3, verse 1. James says, Not many of you should become teachers, my fellow believers. Why? Because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. That's why I say I don't care what you want. <laughs> I don't mean to be rude. I'm being honest. <laughs> I have to stand before God for every word I preach. Man, that's a scary thing. So you know what? I don't want to use somebody else's illustrations. I don't even want to use stories about me. I just want to teach God's truth as faithfully as I can in the power of the Holy Spirit. And I let the Holy Spirit do what he does. You, you know what I'm saying? Because I am scared to death about standing before God, and I have to give an answer for every word I've taught. That's a scary prospect. John Calvin, right before he died, he said to his church in Geneva as he was leaving, I have not corrupted one word of Scripture as far as I know. He said, I have studied, and I have studied, and I have studied to be simple. That's what I want to be able to say. I want to be able to stand before God and say, God, as far as I know, I have not corrupted one word. I have not been lazy. I have not just taken a passage and just kind of, you know, zip something out. I can come up with this. I can do it. I can, I've taught scripture long enough. I can take verses 3 through 11 and I can wow you with it. I can come up with clever little illustrations and stories. You go, wow, you'll remember the illustration and story. You won't know nothing about the scripture. Back to 1 Timothy. As I urge you, verse 3, when I went into Macedonia, stay there in Ephesus so that you may, not, so that you may command, Perengelo, certain people, certain men who we believe were elders, not to teach heteros doctrine any longer or to devote themselves to muthos, myths, or endless genealogies, numerologies. Why? Such things promote controversial speculations rather than advancing God's good work, which is by faith. The goal of this command, Timothy, Paul said to him, is love, love for God and, lo and for God's holy name, which comes from a pure heart and a good conscience and sincere faith. Timothy, some have departed, missed the mark from these things, and instead they have turned to the talk of fools. Timothy, verse 7, they want to be teachers of the law, which is a good thing. But they don't know what they're talking about, which is a bad thing. Or what they so confidently, what? Affirm. You see the teachers? See why they wanted to be teachers? They wanted to be popular. They had no clue what they were teaching. Yet they said to everybody, this is the truth. That's pride. 
We got some examples in Scripture of those guys. Let's go real quick to Matthew 23. There were some other teachers who wanted to be popular. Jesus kind of ripped them. They were called the Pharisees. And what did Jesus call them? Hypocrites. Look at verses 1 through 7. Then Jesus said to the crowds and his disciples, The teachers of the law and the Pharisees, they sit in Moses' seat. So you must be careful to do everything they tell you. In other words, if they're teaching truth, you've got to obey it. He goes, but don't do what they do. Oh my goodness, how about that one? For they do not practice what they preach. They tie up heavy, cumbersome loads and put them on other people's shoulders, but they themselves are not willing to lift a finger to move them. Everything they do, verse 5, is done for people to see. They make phylacteries wide and, and ta the tassels on their garments long. They love the place of honor at banquets and the most important seats in the synagogues. They love to be greeted with respect in the marketplace and to be called rabbi by others. No wonder you want to be a teacher. Look at the popularity. People bow down to you. You get the best seats. Go to 2 John towards the end of the Bible here. There's another guy here who loved not just popularity, but look at his pride. Third John, look at verses 9 and 10. John, writing to the church, by the way, we believe in Ephesus. <laughs> he goes, I wrote to the church, but there was a guy there by the name of Dio Threfis. What are the next five words? Who loves to be what? First. He won't welcome us. He was a leader in the church. He wouldn't even welcome the Apostle John because he wanted to keep teaching lies. He said it was true. Diotrephes, he loves to be first. So John says, when I come, I will call attention to what he's doing, spreading malicious nonsense about us. Not satisfied with that, he even refuses to welcome the believers. You see the pride? He also stopped those who want to do so, and he puts them out of the church. There's your definition of false teacher right there. You see it? Pride, popular, what, they want to be popular, and they're prideful. Yet they don't know what they're talking about when it comes to Scripture. Back to 1 Timothy. So we're getting a picture of who the false teachers were and how they were, right? Now Paul goes, look. You know, they wanted to be teachers of the law, verse 7. Paul goes, look, verse 8. We know that the law is good, right? If one uses it what? Properly, lawfully. In fact, in the Greek right here, the word he uses for good is kalos. He goes, we know that God's law is kalos, intrinsically good, beautiful, ethical, honorable. Of course God's law is good because it's from God. He goes, but it's good if one uses it properly. What's the purpose of the law? To show people their sin, right? In fact, I put three uses of the law. One of the reasons why God gave, up, gave his law was for, was for civil use. God's laws are to be followed so that we can have safe society, right? Do not murder. Well, good, that protects us as citizens. Do not steal, that protects us as citizens. So one of the uses of God's law is civil. But a second use of God's law is pedagogical. You guys learn in the Galatians study? It's a tutor that leads us where? It shows us our sin and leads us to Christ. That's the per. Go to Romans real quick, chapter 3. And we'll come back here to 1 Timothy and finish. Romans chapter 3, here we go. Purpose of the law. Verse 20, you need to know this. Paul says, no one will be declared righteous in God's sight. How? By the works of the law. Why, Paul? Well, because that's not the purpose of the law. Through the law, we become conscious of our what? Sin. That's the proper use of the law. Go to uh, 1 Timothy. Paul says, we know the law is good, kalos, because it came from God. If one uses it lawfully, it is good, civilly, to protect society. 
The law, when preached properly, is meant to show people their sinfulness, their lawlessness, so they seek a Savior. And once you are saved, the third use of the law is the moral use. As Christians, we now follow God's law, not to earn salvation, but out of gratitude for the gift of salvation so we can honor and glorify God. Does that make sense? Paul says, we know the law is good if one uses it lawfully. We also know, unlike the teachers who know nothing, <laughs> that the law is not made for the righteous, those who think they're righteous, that they don't need salvation. You know, Jesus said, I did not come to call the righteous, the self-righteous, I came to call the sick. Right? He goes, we know that the law is not made for the righteous, those who think they're okay, but it's meant for lawbreakers and rebels. In fact, here, uh, a lot of theologians believe that Paul was breaking down the Ten Commandments. These first six traits right here refer to our relationship towards God, the first four commandments. He says, we know that the law is not for the righteous, but it's for lawbreakers and rebels. Towards God, right? We break his law, we rebel against God. Towards the ungodly, who don't, obey, who don't honor God's name, and sinful towards the unholy and irreligious. We believe that Paul summarized there those four, the first four commands, our duty towards God. Think about it. God says, you shall have no other gods before me. We break that. We dishonor God's greatness. You shall not make any images and any likenesses and bow down to them. We dishonor God's glory right there, right? Greatness and glory. You shall not use my name in vain. We dishonor his name. And you shall honor the Sabbath. We dishonor God's holiness, his rest. So this segment right here, we believe that Paul's talking about, let me just summarize the law. He goes, the law is not meant to save you. The law is meant for those who break the first four commandments, you know, like uh, lawbreakers, rebels, ungodly, sinful, unholy, religious. Then these next traits have to do with the next six commandments, our duty towards people. Look what he says. For those who kill their fathers and mothers. That's commandment number five. For murderers, that's commandment number six. For the sexually immoral, that's adultery, commandment number seven, which includes those practicing homosexuality. And I put the word up here. It's a very interesting Greek word he uses. Arseno koites. Broken down, arson means male, koite means bed. Talking about men who sleep with other men. And the reason why I wanted to throw that in there is because people have tried to say, well, he's not saying homosexuals there. It's very clear he's saying homosexuals. In fact, just real quick, go to 1 Corinthians. The only other place in the New Testament where this word, arsenokoites, is used is 1 Corinthians chapter 4. I'm sorry, 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Look at verse 9. Paul says, do you not know that wrongdoers will not inherit the kingdom of God? Those who continually practice that. Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who have sex with men. Only other place in the New Testament where the word there is used. Arsenokoites. It's pretty clear. He's talking about homosexuals, right? Go back to 1 Timothy. And we'll close here. Verse 8, unlike the teachers who don't know what they're talking about, Paul says, we know the law is good, kalos, if one uses it lawfully, properly. It doesn't save you. It's meant to show you your sin. We also know that the law is not made for the righteous, those, think, those who think they can follow it on their own. Apparently, that's what was being taught there, mistaught there. He goes, but the law is meant for lawbreakers and rebels and ungodly and sinful, the holy and irreligious people towards God. It's also meant for those who kill their fathers and mothers, commandment 5. It's meant for those who are murderers, commandment six. It's meant for those who are sexually immoral for and for those who practice homosexuality, commandment seven. We also know it's for slave traders. And again, I put up there in the, in the Greek, it actually means kidnappers, commandment eight, those who steal. Back then in the Greek culture, it was very popular to steal children. Very popular. Steal children, turn them into slaves. We see commandment nine, liars and perjurers. 
and for whatever else is contrary to what kind of doctrine? Sound. Do you see it? Who you need to know? Hygienic doctrine. Paul used false doctrine, referring to the false teachers. Paul says sound doctrine is using God's word, his law, properly. You see the difference? False teachers didn't know what they were talking about. Paul goes, we know the purpose of the law. And for whatever else is contrary to the sound doctrine that conforms to the gospel concerning the glory of the blessed God, which Paul said he entrusted to me. And we'll stop here today. I wanted you to see the seriousness of what Timothy had to deal with. And I, want you to, I wanted you to see the seriousness of Paul writing to Timothy. False doctrine will destroy a person and destroy a church. And think about what false teachers do. They want to be popular. They're very prideful. They confidently think they know what they're talking about, even though they don't have a clue what they're talking about. And they mislead people through myths, endless genealogies, controversy, speculations. They draw people away from true love from God, true faith in God. They draw people away from a good conscience, a pure heart. You know why? Because it's all about them. And actually, what their ultimate goal is, chapter 6, we'll stop here. Look what Paul says about them. They're conceited and they understand nothing. They have an unhealthy interest in controversies and quarrels about words that result in envy, strife, malicious talk, evil suspicions, and constant friction between people of a corrupt mind who have been robbed of the truth and who think that godliness is a means to what? Do you see it? You see the end goal? Financial gain. Friends, it doesn't change. What was happening back then happens today. And you have got to fight the good fight. Protect the sound doctrine that God in his grace has given us that has sailed down to us on the sea of blood from so many faithful men and women who gave their lives for the integrity of God's truth. We who are called to serve the Lord, we need to honor the Lord. Good conscience, sincere faith, pure heart, and love for God. And don't ever be afraid to command people to stop teaching heteros doctrine because you are your brother's keeper. And most importantly, you have to answer to God. Make sure on that day that he says to you, well done, good and faithful servant. Amen? Let's pray. Almighty God, we do thank you so much for your word of truth and thank you that we have the privilege and opportunity to continue to learn it together. Lord, my prayer for all of us, myself included, give us a humble heart. Give us a learning heart, a teachable heart. God, it's not about us being right and somebody else being wrong. It's about all of us being in submission to your truth. Learning your truth from your spirit and living and leading in a way that brings glory to you. Lord, give us that love for you. Give us that good conscience, that sincere faith and pure heart, Lord. And give us the courage, Lord, to fight the good fight of the faith. Help us, Lord, not to get involved in the wrong fights. Help us not to be arrogant and controversial like false teachers. Help us to be people who do not lust out of greedy gain for materialism, like the false teachers. Help us to be humble, not prideful. Help us to, real, to not seek popularity, like the false teachers. Help us to be humble men and women of God 
who consider our lives worth nothing other than to bring glory to your holy name. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your love. In Jesus' name, amen.